David and Juan Carlos would join me. I'm gonna have, oh, we never decided. Juan Carlos, how do you feel about starting? We didn't flip a coin. Okay, um, while they're talking, think of questions that you have for the panel in the second half. The second half of the night is a large format group discussion with even more panelists. This number goes to my phone. Start sending those questions in and we'll lob them up to our panelists later. You feel good? We're good? Give a round of applause to Juan Carlos Martinez. All right, uh, so my name is Juan Carlos Martinez. That's Juan Carlos Martinez in English for you guys who don't speak Spanish. Um, now, I agree with everything Sarah said in terms of the caveats uh, to this racism exists and is bad and white supremacy exists, or white, or white supremacists exist and it is bad. But that's not the question that we're discussing today. The question is, is white supremacy a real threat to America? So I have 12 minutes, so I'm gonna speak fast. Um, and, and, the, and really, it's, is it an existential threat to minorities is an existential threat to the fabric of American society today. Now, we agreed that it was a threat at one point, unquestionably, that uh, the, there was slavery and that uh, was rooted in racism and in white supremacy to be sure, and that led to the Civil War. It was an existential threat to be sure, and then the effects of, of this national sin are still with us. Nobody questions that. But again, is white supremacy an existential threat to America today? Now, uh, first, let me define white supremacy. The Merriam-Webster Dictionary offers a, 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 a um, definition that I think is good. It's, white supremacy is the belief that white, the white race is inherently superior to other races and that white people should have control over people of other races. This is a very good definition because it uh, focuses in, uh, uh, it's very specific and it helps focus the conversation. So. Uh, belief that white race is superior to other races and believe that the white race should control other races. Well, happily, since we live in a representative democracy and citizens get to choose who their leaders are, who has control, we have, I think, an objective measure uh, to, uh, to look at whether or not white supremacy is an existential threat today. Uh, do, do white people, do, does this country believe that uh, white people need to be in control? If we look at the presidential election, in the, uh, if we look at the last, uh, at, at the three winning tickets uh, that have garnered the most votes in presidential elections, the most votes in history, number three was 2012 Obama-Biden ticket, uh, number two, uh, 2008 Obama-Biden ticket, and number one, as we all know, the Biden-Harris ticket. Uh, and this one's particularly important because 66% of those who are eligible to vote, voted. This is the highest in over a century. So it tells us a lot. And they, it, they got, the, the Biden-Harris ticket got 81.3 million votes, by far the most in history. And of course, the thing that's common to all three, besides Joe Biden, is that there's an African-American in all three of these tickets that have the most votes, most winning, uh, for, for winning tickets in presidential history. Um, so by definition, a white supremacist country does not elect black people to govern them. So there's a sense in which, looking at this, because we live in a representative democracy, it's less complicated. This particular question is less complicated than it might seem. Objectively, objectively, uh, the, the results show that this is not, an in, not indicative of white supremacy. Now there's more good news. Uh, the future looks bleak for white supremacy advocates. Millennials and Gen Z voted in favor of Biden-Harris by a 20% margin over the Trump-Pence ticket. So young people don't have any problem uh, voting for somebody who's not white to, be, uh, to, uh, to, to have a rule, rule over them, in a sense, as, as president or vice president. And 61% of the Biden-Harris vote was white. Now, non-white Latinos make up a little bit under 60% of the population, so that also, objectively, is not indicative of white supremacy. Now, it's not just the federal election. If we look at mayoral races, the four largest city in this country, you look at the mayors for those, uh, for those cities, uh, two of them are African-American, including Houston with Sylvester Turner, and one of them is Mexican-American, and the other one is white. And the one who's white is married to an African-American. So again, uh, both at the federal and local level, Americans, including white Americans, aren't electing their leaders based on the color of their skin. People of color can run for office and can get elected. And this was, hasn't always been the case in this country. So that's good. Um, this objectively is not indicative of white supremacy. Now, anecdotally, um, David Williams and I are both um, 
ministers. It's a licensed minister and ordained minister in the, in the Presbyterian Church in America, uh, which is a majority white, almost 80% of, of, the, um, of, of the members of the PCA are, are white. And yet, uh, Presbyterians elect their, their ministers. And um, they, they, we, we elected a black um, pastor to be the moderator of General Assembly uh, in 2019. And also, we, we've been, uh, anybody who's ordained is elected by the congregation. And this is one of the vows that the congregation takes. The congregation says, uh, is asked the question, do you promise to receive the word of truth from his mouth, from David Williams' mouth, from my mouth, with meekness and love, and to submit to him in the due exercise of discipline? majority white congregation vowed to submit to, to my authority in spiritual matters when they ordain me, and they'll do the same with David. Now, this is the exact opposite of the definition of white supremacy, who will not do that. In fact, will seek to have a white person have control over the other races. So again, this is good news uh, for where we stand with respect to this particular question. So why are we having this event then? Why is there so much racial tension? Uh, well, I would uh, propose that it's because generations of Americans have been indoctrinated with a worldview that sees everything through the lens of race. And that skin color, according to this worldview, determines your lot in life, and there is uh, no way to change it almost because the system is rigged. And this is such a pervasive idea that if you even question it, if you question the tenets of this worldview, that, is, that in itself is evidence of racism. In fact, uh, right now, according to this worldview, I am engaging in silencing minority voices. I, a minority, am silencing minority voices right now, according to this worldview, which is ironic because the concepts and terminology being promoted by this worldview don't come from minority voices. They come largely from white voices. They're white inventions, terms like whiteness or white privilege or white fragility. These all come, these are all white ideas and white concepts. And the reason for this is that the wealthy, highly educated liberal whites tend to be among the most ardent proponents of woke ideology. So why is questioning this such a threat? It's not because you're silenced in minority voices. It's because it doesn't serve the values of white elites. There's a kosher white supremacy, I think, that is being promoted. Um, it's the supremacy of white ideology. And it's pernicious because if you have the wrong ideology, you're a white racist, whether or not you're white. Regardless of the color of your skin, you're a white racist if you have certain ideas. This is why, by the way, uh, somebody can say, a presidential candidate can say, if you don't vote for me, you ain't black, and get elected without, without, without problems. Why? Because there, there's an ideology that's behind it and says that's, that's fine, even if it's not fine. Now, this kosher white supremacy, this woke supremacy, is a real problem in America. And it is an existential threat because functionally it's a religion. This, this uh, religion, wokeanity, if you will, has all the trappings of religion. It has a god, namely government, who is the protector, provider, and great physician. It has prophets, university presidents, CEOs, media moguls, um, Hollywood execu executives who cast vision and promote woke orthodoxy. It has priests, professors, and scientists who enjoy the trust of people and exercise authority. They dispense the grace of technology and of medical breakthroughs. And, has, and they mediate between the laity and the American dream. It has evangelists, activists who uh, transform minds and change hearts. And sometimes the only qualification is have a megaphone, will travel. It has saints, uh, victims, people that are endowed with sublime dignity because of, and special knowledge because of their experience, sometimes even uh, becoming martyrs. Uh, it has sacraments. Uh, like every religion, good religion does, visible signs of an invisible truth, uh, where by external actions you show that you're a good person. That's virtue signaling. It has penance, countless liturgies of lament, for example, in which uh, there's a daily admission of guilt, internalization, recital of approved anti-racist prayers. There's a permanent purgatory for white people only. There's also sacred texts, uh, how to be an anti-racist, white fragility. These texts are to be memorized. You are to live by the system of doctrine promoted therein, and they're inerrant and infallible. They cannot be questioned. There's a catechesis, the kindergarten through graduate school curriculum that dominates the public schools and the, and the private schools as well, where the tenets of wokeness, critical race theory, gender theory, are taught in every level of the education system. You see, this wokeanity is a fundamentalist religion. It cannot be questioned. There's no tolerance for dissent. They will take your job. 
They'll take your health care. They'll take your children because, by definition, you are a wicked person if you hold to these ideas. It is a religion that relies on white guilt, promotes greed, and eliminates grace. It operates in a framework of fear. Fear that your neighbor is a racist. Fear that your pastor is a racist. Fear of being a bad person. Fear that you're a racist. Fear of missing out. It's all guilt and greed and no grace. Now, conventional white supremacy is not an existential threat, as it once was, to be sure. But kosher white supremacy is. This woke supremacy is an existential threat. So what are we to do? Well, we are to replace it with word supremacy. We have to stop this lazy and unbiblical practice of judging people by the color of their skin. The biblical worldview says that we all come from the same source. There's, uh, in Genesis 1, we are created male and female um, and in the image of God in likeness, and then we are told to be fruitful and multiply. Everybody comes from Adam and Eve, and then after the flood, from Noah and his sons. There's no other kind of human being. We have the same source, we're the same kind of creatures, we're made from the same substance, and we are inherently equal. So our obsession with racial differences borders on wickedness, because skin color doesn't make a difference. It does great damage, in fact, to focus in, on these things. It, uh, woke ideology offers a materialistic worldview um, it, where, where the good life is only possible by attaining things. So critical race theory uh, says that the barrier to, all, to, to, to getting things must be destroyed at any cost because without it, there's no hope. Now, some may say, well, critical race theory is, is, is a useful tool because it identifies the problem correctly, even if it gives the wrong solution because it doesn't give the gospel. And I would agree with that, that it doesn't give the right solution, but I would also say that it doesn't give the right problem either. Imagine that life was an airplane, and there's people in first class, and there's people in coach. And the people in coach need to get to first class if you're going to experience all the privileges they're in. But all the seats are taken. The only way you can get to first class is if somebody in first class loses their seat or is willing to trade with you. And then you can experience all the goodness, the good life that is found in first class. That's that zero-sum game is the, what, what critical race theory is, would say this life is all about. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible would say that you go through first class and you look into the po cockpit. And what you would find is that the pilot is dead. And that everybody in the plane is actually dead and they just don't know it. Because they're going to crash. So the solution is not get from coach to first class. The solution is you need to get on a different plane. You need, to, you need Christ to be the one who's piloting your plane because he's the only one that can save you. He's the only one that can take you home. He, listen, the only difference between human beings is, is, is not, has nothing to do with race. It has to do with whether you're in Adam or in Christ. Minorities don't need white people to save us. We need Jesus to save us, just like white people do. Let me close with Ephesians 2, verses 13 to 14 and, and verse 19. It says, But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. So you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Listen, the dividing wall of hostility has been broken down by Christ. Don't labor to build it back up. Trust in Christ. Look to him. Forget these differences that mean nothing anymore. Because in Jesus Christ, we're not victims, we're victors. We're Presbyterians. We, we keep everything in a notebook. So this is, this is my, my dear friend and my brother, uh, trusted in the Lord. I have much respect for Juan Carlos. Uh, he was a part of the committee that licensed me. Um, and so I just want it to be known that just because we may share a different perspective on this issue, what unites us is greater than our view on this isolated topic. We've got bigger fish to fry than to sit here and try to haggle over who's right and who's wrong on this one issue. And so I just wanted to be clear on that before I, before I get started. Yeah. I'm going to read something that I've written. Slavery in the United States lasted from 1619 to 1863, followed by 14 years of Reconstruction, followed by 60 years of Jim Crow, 
followed by 30 years of the civil rights era. For 402 years, 157 years predating America as a nation, the condition that existed hails blacks as being inferior, limiting their access to education and opportunity, relegating them to the margins of society with a permanent second class status. This was primarily done in four ways. Restricting blacks from accumulating wealth, restricting blacks access to education, restricting blacks access to the job market, and mass incarceration. Between 1934 and 1965, the period between Jim Crow and civil rights, the United States government backed 120 billion in home loans for white Americans, while black Americans had to pay cash for their property. The result was increased property ownership for whites with blacks being forced to rent or only allowed to buy in certain parts of town. This practice, known as redlining, created urban centers, essentially segregating America with the lasting effects of deterring investments and disallowing building wealth through inheriting property among blacks as it did with whites. Since property taxes fund schools, families in nicer areas fund better schools, thus their children receive a better education. Families in poorer areas fund poorer schools, resulting in poorer levels of education. Blacks, having been redlined into poorer areas with poorer schools, ensures lower levels of education and a lack of opportunity. In consequence of redlining in poorer schools, a lack of education leads to a lack of job opportunities, and this facilitates the fourth domain of segregating America, mass incarceration. At the end of the Civil Rights Movement, the prison population was hovering around 200,000. By 2016, that number was just under one and a half million, with blacks being sentenced at a rate six times greater than whites. It seems that even in a post-Civil Rights America, laws were passed which specifically targeted the black community. Today, we're still living with these effects. And the reason it persists is because none want to take responsibility for propagating the cycle. Racism cannot be reduced to a single practice or discourse by isolated individuals, but an evolving, recreating manifestation of the logic of superiority and inferiority based solely on skin color. With few exceptions, the American church has been complicit and is still so to this day. White privilege has been defined as an invisible package of unearned assets which those who possess can count on cashing in each day, but about which they remain oblivious. This suggests a level of cultural advantage that whites have today that they aren't even aware of. That whites in America have by and large benefited from generation after generation of advantage born of racism has given them a sense of normalcy in their advantage. Acknowledging this tends to be extremely hard for them, usually being met with discursive claims to deflect, redirecting to reverse discrimination or claiming that we now live in a colorblind society. As such, racism is perceived as an individual moral failure. I never owned any slaves is a common refrain. But while racism is construed in personal terms, alibis abound and even few racists would exist today. With the advent of the civil rights, overt personal racism fell out of fashion, at least until Trump became president giving rise to the false notion that racism itself was a thing of the past. This ignores that there is an entire machine built over hundreds of years whose sole purpose was to ensure the subjugation of one part of the population for the benefit of the other. Claiming ignorance or individual innocence serves only to reinforce the systemic nature of racism. Closely related to white privilege is white supremacy. What separates the two is that white privilege is unconsciously enjoyed, while white supremacy is a deliberate attempt to maintain white cultural domination. 
within the past 20 years or so, there are those who, under the guise that racism is no more, began to attack such policies as affirmative action, and fair housing, claiming that such policies were really stifling those that they were originally meant to assist and creating an added burden on better qualified people of non-color. In just a few short years, whites had suddenly now become the victims of racism. Was not affirmative action reverse systemic racism? If there were no affirmative action, we would then have the ideal. Only the most suitable candidates without regard to race would be hired. Isn't this what a colorblind society would do ideally? But such a notion ignores the entire history of the United States and its treatment of people of color who are having to live with the residual effects of constitutionally mandated institutional racism. Oddly, evangelicals, largely mum on systematic racism, have suddenly sounded the alarm against things as critical race theory. For them, it's not the historic and lingering systematic racism that's a danger. It's the response to systematic racism that's the real danger. According to Pew, of the African Americans who identify as Christian, only 14% identify as evangelical. 53% identify as historically black Protestant, for good reason. Evangelical Protestants have traditionally been the flag bearers of systematic racism in America. There is now a generation of African Americans who reject not only evangelicalism, but historic Christian orthodoxy. Not for orthodoxy's sake, but because of those with whom it is associated. To an extent, the failure of evangelical Protestantism to attract significant numbers of African Americans can be directly attributed to their unwillingness to address their core cultural concerns of dignity, identity, and significance. Hence, the traditional African American church has recoiled from evangelicalism and embraced their own tradition as well as mainline Protestantism. So why is it so hard for some evangelicals to acknowledge this? Simply, the system works to their advantage. They want to pass along the advantages their fathers had and passed on to them, to their children. Proverbs says that a gift perverts justice, and after several generations, perverted justice can become the cultural norm, conveniently unquestioned by its beneficiaries. In Acts 6, we see there was a stir in the distribution among the Greek and Hebrew widows. The Greeks complained to the apostles that they were being unfairly given smaller portions. The apostles did their due diligence and found this to be the case, and having done so, they listened to the Greek widows and made the correction. Now, had they asked the Hebrew widows, there was no problem. None whatsoever. Everything was fine just the way it was, and there was no need to make any changes. What the apostles did was listen to those who claimed an injustice was being carried out, just as the scriptures dictated they do. Proverbs 17, 15, 31, 8 and 9, Jeremiah 22, 3 to 5, Isaiah 1, 17, Exodus 23, 6. Fault is one thing, responsibility is another. Most Americans alive today and most evangelicals cannot be faulted for not standing with their black brothers and sisters in the past. They are, however, responsible for ensuring the cultural and political commitments that existed and still exist do not take priority over the harsh realities experienced by their brothers and sisters of color. In the 1960s, during the Civil Rights Movement, Evangelicals called it communism. Today, they hide behind terms like cultural Marxism and intersectionality. They missed it then, and they miss it today. Part of the problem is that evangelicals defer their thinking on this to secular thought and hold tight to cultural commitments. The truth is that we need not defer to either secular theories seeking to explain racism 
or cable news opinion makers wanting to frame how we should think on these issues. I am less concerned about racism in a fallen world than I am about racism in the redeemed church. Those of us who name the name of Christ have prior been informed by God's word on the condition of this world as well as the solution. Racism is a result of the fall whereby creatures have been so corrupted by sin that it has thoroughly infected their being. It disrupts our relationship with God as well as with one another. The solution is given to us in Jesus Christ, where there is no longer Jew nor Gentile, but we are all the eschatological new humanity recreated in Christ, a holy nation, royal priesthood. We are in the culture not to affirm the culture, but to stand over and apart from the culture to be a witness and a testimony to the true and living God. This is the ideal we strive for. But it is impossible so long as we are sucked into taking sides in their culture war. The church is its own culture, a kingdom culture, where the value of people is not based on where they come from, what they possess, or where they stand in relation to us. What this fallen world cannot see, and what is only known and revealed by the church, is that the value of people is solely based on Christ having shed His blood on their behalf. Okay, we are going to go ahead and pick this back up. Welcome back. I hope you're having some juicy conversations at your table. So here's how we're going to do this. Again, my number is up here. Feel free. Okay, So, but this is not the time to text me things like, you know... Why is Oscar wearing a Spurs shirt or, you know, pictures of birds or whatever? Like, this is not the time for that. Later, you can text me random things or things to try to make me laugh or lose my cool. I will not lose my cool. So text your questions in. I already have several to start us off with, but here's what I'm thinking we're going to do. I'm going to ask each of our panelists to just take two minutes or less. And some of them are pastors, so time is a little funny. But two minutes or less to tell us who you are. And just maybe some quick reactions or thoughts about this topic, reactions to what you heard um, our speakers say, or just your own thoughts on this as you've been thinking about coming today. But again, two minutes or less, and then we will start lobbing questions up to them and watch the show. You want to just go left to right here? You have a mic? Okay. I'm Evan McClanahan. I'm the pastor at First Lutheran. Uh, let me say, this This was a question I put forward, so if you don't like it, you can blame me. Don't blame Sarah. Yes, she she didn't you. even vote for it. She didn't even want it. So, But I wanted to talk about this. Uh, I know it's more on the social, kind of political end of things. But it seemed like, you know, in the last couple of years, all of a sudden we're talking about white supremacy, which is very charged language, very loaded language. Um, and sort of where did that come from? What what really changed? When I was a kid, you know, white supremacy was, you know, Klan members and neo-Nazis and skinheads and things. It was, a, it was a fringe group. It was a very small number of people. But now it all of a sudden it feels like it kind of became ubiquitous. And your average white person uh, all, all of a sudden found themselves to be because they enjoy white privilege uh, or a certain benefits of a majority white society or whatever, all of a sudden they became white supremacists. And I don't know that that's particularly helpful if we actually do want to bridge uh, the the divide between you know races in this country, so it's not to negate the, ha the 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 history or the past or anything like that. I think one of the questions we have to answer is, but you know, given all the things that have happened in the past, what about today? You know, can you know it? Do, do I have to be a racist today? So one of the things that I would say, just to try to, I guess, be controversial, is to say, I'm not a racist. You know, that's something that to even say today is considered controversial. Of course you're a racist if you're a white person, you because you benefit from all the white privilege and et cetera, et cetera. But um, I think that someone should be able to say that. As a Christian, we are to, uh, you know, you, the Eighth Commandment is not to bear false witness against one another. So unless and until someone can, you know, demonstrate the fact that I am actually a white supremacist, I think that it's okay for me as a Christian to say that I'm not. So... Anyway, that's why I wanted to, to talk about this tonight. Good evening, everybody. My name is Troy Williams, and I was dragged in by this guy to my right, Evan. And, um, yeah, I, I don't, you know, one of the things that 
I was reminded of is that as each person spoke, we have so many perspectives about this. And so, you know, just when you think you nailed it, you know, here you have another person talking about uh, racism or uh, white supremacy, and you say, hey, I haven't thought about it from that position. You know, and then in a crowd like this, you'll say, man, you know, that guy right there is barking right up my alley, but how does that make this person next to me feel? Is in, in, am I the only one in here that feels like that, right? And so it's like, yeah, that's my perspective, but no, I really understand where he's coming from too. And so you, you, you know, so that's kind of what I got out of the first session. Uh, and, you know, of course, I would resonate more with his story, right? Because I'm an African-American living this, this and coming up in this idea, you know? And so I think that it's, um, it's a good topic to have because it impacts not only myself, but it impacts my children's children. It impacts uh, the relationships that they'll have in the future uh, that they have yet to live. And so I think we ought to talk about this thing and go into the deep uh, topics and, and to the topics that make us squirm in our seats even before we have our first beer, right? <laughs> well, not yet. Uh, I haven't. I, well, I have. I, I drink root beer. Oh, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a pastor. I, I do have, I'm a seminary guy. I'm a pastor, but I don't pastor a traditional church, okay? And, I, and since my roots is back in the kind of Baptist, I drink root beer. All right, because Baptist people don't drink in public. Y'all know that, right? <laughs> Does that mean you're sharing your beer with someone else here tonight? Okay, Oscar, take it away. Once you start talking, the sound gurus will make it work. Perfect. Hey guys, I'm Oscar Villanueva, and Evan didn't drag me here, but Evan gets dragged by me on the basketball court. So oh. I just uh, figured I'd tell you that. See, because he's not actually supreme to me. As tall and as white and as lanky, I'm just playing. Um, so I am an educator, but that's, I don't think why I'm here. I was asked to come up here to make this panel less white, so oh <laughs> glad to see you. And I actually think that the, uh, let's call it the brown and the black experience in America are interrelated, if not correlated. And what I mean by that is that the neighborhood in Baytown, Texas, if any of you know where that's at, that I grew up in was actually 90% African American. Ironically, I went to Robert E. Lee High School, where the population was about 40-40, black and brown, and then the other 20% were white with just a very minor Asian community. Um, and what was interesting is that that white population was actually bused there. Again, ironically, they were bus there to increase the tax base of that particular school. So that community was actually trying to, at Robert E. Lee High School, repair some of what we were talking about or what was mentioned earlier. My father brought us to this country from Mexico, so we're a Mexican immigrant family. He spoke no English when he arrived. I spoke no English for the first seven or so years of my life. And I think what I'm trying to do right now is to give you a sense of where I come from because I'm only, I just turned 36. And so if white supremacy was keeping anyone down or trying to keep anyone down, it would be someone just like me, who not only is a minority, but also a stranger, an immigrant, someone who uh, should have probably been kept out of this country. Well, ultimately, I don't find that First of all, any white person is supreme to me. I reject that notion. Secondly, I don't find that it has, that my brownness or my maleness or my status as a Mexican immigrant has in any way kept me from being as successful as I have striven to be while here in this country. So while I understand that racism exists, and by the way, I've felt racism not just from white people, but from pretty much almost anyone that I've ever come across, so racism is very real, very true, but I don't find that this kind of vague notion of white supremacy is holding me back or anyone else that I know who's really trying to apply him or herself to grab hold of success here in this country. Hi, I'm Rachel Poisky. I'm a pastor at Memorial Drive Presbyterian, and I want to share just a little bit uh, my story, how, why I think I'm sitting here, I don't know. I'm really wondering at this point. But, um, 
you know, about five years ago, kind of before the media, everything hype and everything, uh, I really felt God speak to me. He's He's spoke to me maybe three or four times audibly, almost audibly in my life. And I just felt very convicted for him to say, uh, racism is your problem and you need to wrestle with it and you need to sit with it and listen. And uh, I don't listen well, I act. So it was an active (laughs) discipleship for me. And so I've spent a lot of time just saying, okay, God, what are you trying me for me to hear in this? And one of the things that has pushed me a lot is uh, from Revelation 7, when if you look and it says that every tribe and every nation sat down together at the table worshiping the Lamb of God. And I thought, is that where the church is right now? Is that where society is? Is that where we are living at the table, at the communion table together? And I don't think we are. I think there's reconciliation. I think there's things that have to happen. And I have to listen. And when I hear what my brother David says, I have to listen to that. I have to be aware and to, and I think that as a church, we have gotten so reactive. We've jumped into the culture wars and gotten so reactive. And we haven't taken the moment to say, what is the gospel in this? And what is Jesus saying to me? Who am I, what am I personally doing? And what, how am I living out the communion table, the reconciliation? And I think that we really have to start on that individual level and not be a reactive to what's happening around us, but to say internally, what is the church doing? And we need to be completely different. All right. So if you haven't been to this before, or for you guys that haven't been here before, two of you, uh, I'm going to lob a question or two up, and then I'm going to let whoever wants to answer, answer. We're not trying to solve all of these. We're not going to come to the end of the discussion on any of these, and we want to get through as many as we can. So try to keep it succinct. Share the mic as you want, but not everybody has to answer every question, right? Maybe a couple of you each time. Two questions came in that were similar, so I'm going to read them both. We're starting with this. First one says, question, oh, sorry. Is the goal a post-racial society? Is the goal a post-racial society? And then another person said, you could probably word this question better than me, but my question is, what is the end goal? What does a world without white supremacy look like to you? So what's the end goal, and is it a post-racial society? I I don't know if I should go first if I'm the white guy, but um, uh, let me just say, I I don't think that the goal is a post-racial world. Because I think that if we can categorize people as races, that, that makes them interesting. You know, like people are different. Diversity is a good thing. So I don't think the goal is to have everybody the same, everybody be boring and white or something like that. So I don't know. But, but, it, but if the questioner means post-racial in the sense that, you know, we, we were, we're, we're, we're looking beyond race, then yeah, I think that'd be an admirable goal. But generally, I'd like more diversity. Uh, I think that... Uh, you know, so if that's what we mean, like different sorts of cultures being lifted up, I think that's a good thing. What was the second question? Oh, I've already deleted that. Oh. I have a system. Okay. Basically, what's the end goal here? What would a world without white supremacy look like, I think? Yeah, I'm not sure how to... I'm not sure how to, how to answer that one, so... You just take whatever Mike's handed oh, to yeah. you and uh, roll with it. Yeah. Okay, so I don't... Okay, so um, I think the end goal is, I don't think we can eliminate racism or white supremacy, it's just there. And we're talking about, in my, from my perspective, we're talking about something that was rooted into the whole build of America. So it's not, it's not something that's new, it's something that America was built on. It was built on racism, it was built on slavery, so it was built on that. So that's what America is. Right. And so but so I think it's important for us to talk about it. I think the end goal would be just like myself uh, sitting in the seats uh, here tonight, just listening and learning and being willing to grow. You know, I think that's the goal to say we're going to eliminate racism in America. That would be foolish because we can't do that. Right. Uh, Now, another perspective from a black perspective, reparation is really to me. That's a that's a, a good goal to have. Why? Because it's been unfair. And so another another thing too is that 
you know, from a from a black perspective, uh, it's like you know we're fighting this bad battle against white people, and now we have all these other people trying to get a piece of the pie. So we don't, you know, so we have to now. Uh, a lot of other races, are, are, and a lot of diversity is good, you know, but it's also, hey, look, hold on a second. You haven't, we haven't gotten ours yet. You know, so, so, the, so and, and of course, we're in a capitalistic society, so money is important. So we, you know, so how do we sort of, I don't know what the solution is, but I do know that we just have to talk about it and hear each other's perspective because I can tell you when you think when I think my perspective is right, I, I quickly when I listen to the next guy or girl, it's wrong. It's not all right. I'm gonna jump in. I know you two might want to say something, but you used the R word and like four people texted me. What does he mean by reparations? How should reparations work? So I'm just gonna piggyback on what you already said. What's that? Did I say it doesn't have to be you. It could be anybody oh. on there. Yeah. Or if y'all want to tag one of these guys in. <laughs> I, I, it's just a, a financial way to be um, to pay for the damages that were done to black people, you know. So, but I, it's an it's also an impossible way to fix the problem because what number would we come up with, you know? If we're talking about financially uh, helping, uh, I can't remember exactly what it was. It was you know each person when they when when slavery was over was supposed to get so much land and so many many. Um, you know, livestock, and that didn't happen, right? But if you think about it, the people who got the land and the livestock were, are years and generations ahead of those who did not, right? And so it's, uh, so reparation is a way to, to make the, the, the plane feel a little level, more leveler, but it's no way to, I mean, how do you come up with a number? Somebody else asked, I'm, I don't usually do this feed it while you're on the question, but why not? We'll change it up. But someone else said, should someone be a direct descendant of slaves or other, or do other African American uh, immigrants qualify for reparations? Again, well, you don't have to answer oh, all these okay. questions. You don't represent okay, all just, of that answer, but you can if you right, want. Right, but I would just, you know. <laughs> what are your thoughts on this? Room? As an African immigrant myself. Uh, <laughs> so, I mean, if we, if we believe that we're all sons of Adam, then in a way, we probably are. Um, to the First of all, to the question of a post-racial society, I think the only one that's described um, in the Bible is in Revelation. But Galatians gives us a very clear post-racial ethos when it says there's no longer Greek or uh, Jew, slave or free, male or female. So a society without those kinds of distinction is, I think, a Christian ideal. I think that sin and the way that it affects society in general makes it virtually impossible to, to reach or achieve on this side of eternity. Um, but honestly, to the, to the question of how can you actually restitute or make recompense for situations in the past, I think that that is such a philosophical question that I don't know that you could land on a number. And then I think the natural question becomes is, let's say that number could be found and could be satisfied would inequity still persist afterwards? If you were to level the playing field today and redistribute funds in such a way that everyone had the same starting point, would you then have the same end point for everyone? Would all of your effects be the result of equal causes? I, I seriously find that philosophically difficult to justify. Having said all that, if any of you white people in here feel very guilty <laughs> and want to give me any of your money, please feel free. Please feel free. Thank you. Does anyone else want to grab on that, or I can go to the next question? Okay, so we're all giving our money to Oscar. Yeah. I, I rebuke that. Okay. I'm a poor, poor educator. <laughs> all right, you had your time with the mic. You didn't ask for anything, so. Okay, this person says, what should we be more conscious of? Avoiding being labeled a racist, or avoiding hurting people, unintentionally or otherwise, in racist ways? Is there sometimes a conflict between the two? And along with that, what's so scary about being called a racist? Is it worse than dealing with racist people and institutions on a regular basis? I can, in fact, start over, yes. All right, Facebook, you can chime in too. What should we be more conscious of? Avoiding being labeled a racist. I believe Evan said something like, I'm not a racist, which was meant to be provocative. So 
this person's asking. What should we be more conscious of? Avoiding being labeled a racist or avoiding hurting people unintentionally or otherwise in racist ways. Is there sometimes a conflict between the two? And along with that, what's so scary about being called a racist? Is it worse than dealing with racist people and institutions on a regular basis? There's a dichotomy there the person's building you may not agree with, but. So to be called a racist is like the worst thing that you can be called. Uh, am, am I wrong? I mean, there, there are people who have lost, uh, I don't know, Oscar husking gigs, uh, you know, jobs, uh, you know, their docs, they're, 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 they're become non-persons on social media because they said something, uh, you know, many, many years ago that was racist. I mean, to call someone a racist is to exert a lot of power over them. So, uh, I, I, so yeah, I do think that to, you know, to, to have that as a sort of sort of Damocles constantly hanging over people and saying, yes, you know, if, if you don't conform to this particular standard, you're a racist. If you're not anti-racist enough, then you'll be called a racist. That's a very powerful thing, and I don't think that's good. I don't think that's fair. Again, Christians live by the Eighth Commandment. We don't bear false witness against our neighbor. And so, uh, and, and, and less... Uh, I, I believe the standard should be, unless there is good reason to believe that someone really is a racist, in the sense that they believe that they uh, they believe their own race is superior to the, that of another, they ought not to be called a racist. Now, I guess the the argument is, hey, just go ahead and own it. Just go ahead and say you're a racist, admit it, and maybe that takes the power out of it, or um, you know, or then we can sort of solve the problem. But I don't think it's I don't think it solves the problem to admit to something that I'm not. Um, I, I think that what we should do is we should say, uh, you know, as Christians, this is the humanity that we have in common, and and this is the way that we can be brothers and sisters together. So I, I think that is this that that is the path forward, not to admitting to something that you're not. Yeah, I I think we have to ask ourselves hard questions when we are looking at that and say, I'm sorry, that question was very long and hard for me to follow, but but I think that, um, sorry to whoever sent it, apologize for that, but I, okay, can I, this is one stupid example. I was talking to my friend and um, he was, you know, we we're talking about ATM and I was like, you know, women are scared to go to the ATM at night. They're scared to go. And he's like, what? Because I'm like, you're a man. You don't think about that because you can go to the ATM at night. You don't worry about it unless maybe you get a little scared. I said, every woman in this room, mostly, is scared to go to an ATM at night. And he goes, I never thought about that. And I was like, exactly. I think that's the problem we have is we don't think about other people's experience. And we're caught up in saying, oh, I'm not this, I'm not that. But have you stopped to ask about somebody else's experience? Do you have mentors that are different races than you? Do you have teachers that are different races than you? Do you have, read books of people? Who, what are you wrapping around your life to give you different experiences that make you ask the question, am I racist or not? Did anyone want to piggyback on that? Well, as someone who actually has experienced racism in applying for apartment complexes, in whose parents will allow me to date their daughters, in on the basketball court. Um, I find that what's, what's often probably left out of the conversation is the con continuous redefining of the term racism that we're, that we're seeing, that we're experiencing. It, it seems that we can't even nail down what racism means. And if now racism means that it can only be exerted on people by people who have power, which in this country it's supposed to mean white people, I just completely re reject that definition. I don't think that it's a one-way street or even a two-way street. I think that it can come from pretty much any uh, of the different divisions, if we want to call them that, towards any of the others. And sometimes there's even colorism even within communities. Like in the Latino community, indigenous people often suffer uh, from colorism from Latinos who look more European. So I think that unless we're going to actually define the term in its most simple definition, which is to say that I am better than you or you are worse than me because of the class distinction of race, then it makes it really hard to talk about this conversation. Somebody sent in a follow-up question. Rachel, I think 
it doesn't say it's for you, but I think it is. It says, does someone else's experience make me racist? Because you said, listen to other people's experience. Um, I think it can if, you know, if you're not able to hear it well. Um, there, you know, what does it say? Act justly, seek mercy, walk humbly. This conversation requires an immense amount of humility. And I mean, even sitting here, I feel like humbled because you have to be open to what you do not know. And that's a big part of this conversation that we fail to do. Everybody has an opinion, but you have to sit and say, what do I not know? And what is somebody else's experience? And, you know, I've, I've seen shed light in my own life for things I've had to repent about. And it's not pretty. This is not a pretty work. It's a long work. And you have to decide if you're going to do it or not. I'm going to move us on just because we have half an hour and like, you know, roughly 100 questions. Okay. Um, this next question says, what should Christians think of BLM? There seems to be a tear it down, build it back up philosophy, but is that best? I'll ask it one more time. I'm buying you guys time. Just think of how you want to answer. Okay. What should Christians think of BLM? That's Black Lives Matter. Okay. There seems to be a tear it down, build it back up philosophy, but is that best? But not all at once, so don't go crazy. So, so, so first of all, Black Lives Matter doesn't represent every black life. Let's just pause there and let that maybe sink. Because it's, you know, I, but I think one strategy, one strategy is to, is to go all the way, all the way to the left so that you can get something done. So, but if you, if you're too close to the, the medium, you know, if you, you if you're right on the other side, you know, and maybe there's not a lot, there's not so much that can be done. So I think the extremists, you know, even though uh, that's not, you know, I'm not in full agreement with their approach, right? The things that they're fighting for, I am in agreement with, right? But not with their approach. So there's a lot of blacks who do not support Black Lives Matter in their approach. But I haven't met any black that who disagree with what they're fighting for. Does that make sense? Yeah. Right. And so uh, now that's my perspective. So and it's not my perspective, it's my experience, I would say. Yeah. Right. And so that's that's kind of like my two cents on that that particular uh, question. And maybe from that, we might be able to have a conversation. If the question if the question is, how should Christians feel about BLM? As a set of three words, I think we should be in full endorsement of the three words. I think that your life matters just as much as Evan's or Rachel's or mine. And so in that sense, I think it's something that I could wholeheartedly embrace as a set of three words. As a slogan for a movement who has posted what they affirm online and has published various works, I actually can't affirm everything that they fight for because a lot of what they fight for is actually the destruction of entire systems that often don't really touch on issues of race, like the destruction of capitalism, for example. I don't think that there is a better socioeconomic system in the world that is going to promote the most amount of people coming out of poverty. I don't see that we need to tear down law enforcement to its bolts and somehow reimagine it as community counselors. I don't actually think that everything about the American experience is inherently flawed and needs to be destroyed and then rebuilt and reimagined. I think that this language is dangerous and I think that it's ultimately um, devoid of any real plan for the future. Most of the language that I hear coming from BLM is about tearing things down or getting rid of any kind of repercussion for criminality. I mean, now you can go into a Walgreens in some places and just fill trash bags full of whatever it is that you want and walk right out of it and they can't prosecute you. And for that to be something that is promoted actively by some, maybe not every person that uh, would wave a BLM flag, I think is highly dangerous and very destructive. I have a couple questions that actually came in for our earlier speakers, so I'm going to give this to them real fast, and then we're going to take it back to the panel. 
Okay, for JC, that's Juan Carlos, but it also sounds like Jesus Christ, so that's a, it's a promotion. Uh, the question is, how is, quote, we elected a black president so white supremacy can't be a threat to America, end quote, different from, I have black friends so I can't be racist? Well, I mean, you, you can have black friends and, and, and be a racist, I suppose. It would be very bizarre to, to have white friends. Maybe you need to redefine what friendship means. If you, if you can say, this person is my friend, and I think I'm superior to him, and I think that I need to rule over him because he's not capable of ruling, and he, and there, he has deficiencies, but he's my friend, that's a bizarre thing. Uh, if, if that's your definition of friendship, then I, also, I guess you, know, you could also in the same way vote for somebody to, uh, to, to govern and, and still harbor those kinds of feelings. Um, the fact that we, just the definition of white supremacy uh, as some, uh, somebody that, or a white supremacist is somebody who believes that white, the white race is superior to other races and that the white race should control other races. The fact that we have free elections and that's not the way the electorate is voting by and large means that I would say it's a very clear indicator that white supremacy is not such a large problem that it is an existential threat. That doesn't mean that there aren't people that are white supremacists. There are. Or there are the, that are racist. There are, of course, yes. Um, but the question was, is it an existential threat? I, I believe that the election results, um, not just the presidential election, but across the board, thankfully, say that it's not an existential threat. We gotta hand it to Juan Carlos and David because unlike the panelists, they just have to answer right away. Like they don't get to be like, oh, Oscar, do you want to? Evan, do you want to? Anyway, uh, so David, this question is for you. It says, how would you define white culture? You must have used that phrase, white culture. How do you define it? I did not use that phrase. <laughs> I would not use that phrase. Uh, culture, uh, yeah, no, culture, culture is, uh, Culture is ever evolving and changing, so there's no culture that, that can be directly associated with an ethnic group. Um, I think what they were talking about is, I think that what we have, the term that I would use is white cultural supremacy. And so what that simply means is that the majority thinks that everybody sees things the way that they do they don't take into account that we have different lived experiences. Um, we might be in the same place, we might go to the same churches, we might attend the same school, uh, but our life experiences and everything that you have lived that, lived that has led you to where you are and all the things that have led me to where I am may not be the same, we just occupy the same space. Uh, and so I think that I, I don't know white culture. That's a, I'd have to think about that. Uh, I, I would. So I think that the best I could say is that and I don't know that I, I have it in this lecture. But white, like I said, white cultural supremacy is is the idea that everybody thinks the way that that the majority thinks. Applause to both of you. Good job. You can sit down if you want. Yeah. Uh, I released you. Okay. Um, somebody just texted in, what is whiteness? I mean, Evan, it feels like you ought to start that Evan, yeah. Evan, you have to answer this question. <laughs> well, according to one of the Smithsonian Museums, you probably know that whiteness means rugged individualism, emphasis on the systematic method, Protestant work ethic, uh, religion. Any, y'all know what I'm reading from? This, this was a uh, this, was, this was aspects and assumptions of whiteness and white culture in the United States. This, is, this went viral maybe a year or two ago, and this is, a, I think, an older poster, but basically it talks about uh, these quote-unquote characteristics of whiteness that people like me find offensive, um, if, if I'm allowed to be offended. But uh, many of these things are just, I would think, basically sort of standard ways to operate a society, you know, like show up to places on time. I don't think that's a white or black or brown thing. It's just something that you ought to do is to show up. Um, the idea that you should work hard and prepare for your future. I don't know why, why, is, that, uh, why, why is that a bad thing. But I think there is, a, there is a broader question here we can't possibly answer tonight. But it does get to something like a majority culture that has been uh, 
centuries in the making that there are certain values that the majority, because America is a majority white country, uh, and it has been for many centuries. That's just part of our history. Other countries are not majority white countries, and so there are certain cultural norms in those places that are perfectly normal there. That, 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 that is their culture. That's perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But over the centuries, there are certain things that in America, there are certain, you know, that, that we have determined these are, this is part of who we are. This is part of our culture. You know, and if this is the list of what they are, so be it. I don't know why that's necessarily a, a, a bad thing. Uh, you know, we would have to debate the merits of each one's, one of these things. Um, and so I think there's a, a question of like, you know, uh, these things that have happened over time, these cultures that have been, been developed, uh, we, I think we should ask, are, are they, why are they not a good thing? Why would they not be a good thing? But the idea, let, let me just say one more thing, and I'm sorry to do this, but there is a, there's a book, it's a, easy to find and read, um, it's called Coming Apart, and it's a history of, of whiteness in America, believe it or not, looks at white people in America over the last 50 years, and uh, it uh, really categorizes the fact that there's been a rise in white elites and a white working class. And there is a huge growing gap between them. And uh, if you actually look at when other races are involved in the same data, that basically the other races fare very much the same way. So there is a growing divide in this country, absolutely, uh, between the hyper-educated people who are living in cities, people who uh, make a heck of a lot more money than a lot of other people and, and other people. Uh, and white people suffer as a result of that growing divide as much as anybody else. So it's not, I don't even think, just a racial issue. Sorry. Oscar, what is whiteness? I see you chomping. Yeah. In my uh, academic study of whiteness, I have found that it's typified generally by uh, bland cooking, uh, pasty skin, <laughs> awkward dancing, cringe corniness. No, but seriously. Um, the way that quote unquote whiteness has affected me is that to be articulate, to be erudite, to be learned, and to do so proudly and publicly, especially around your minority friends, is cause for an accusation of acting white or trying to pass off as white. And I've also heard the slander of Christ's name as Christianity being white man's religion. Now, I'm sure most of you know, but it was definitely not initiated by white people. It was Near Eastern, mostly Jewish people. And it was not even propagated mostly by white people. Uh, one of the most elite, I would say, theologians was North African, meaning St. Augustine. So to make the claim that Christianity is a white man's religion is also, I think, just slander. And if it makes me someone who wants to be white, or is typified by whiteness to proclaim the name of Jesus Christ and what Orthodox Christianity teaches, then again, like Evan, I would say, so be it. Did anyone else want to touch on what is whiteness, or shall we move on? Well, I think, first of all, we borrow from each other's culture. You know, take, for instance, rap music. Who purchases more rap music than anyone in the world? Hold it more like this. I'm who who purchases rap music more than anyone in the world? There you have it. So, you know, you look at TV and you watch the people dance. You know, white kids dance like black kids. Black kids dance like white kids. You know, now do black people have more soul and a little bit more rhythm? We do more so than whites, but when I look at Latinos, they can get after it. You know what I'm saying? So we're just, we're just, we're pulling from each other's race and that's, so we're becoming something I believe better when we take the good right so I, I don't I don't I, but now when you see African-American females with straight hair that's that's whiteness right or wrong y'all are scared to get into that right <laughs> but but the thing is that if they straighten their hair I, my hair is not straight my hair is kinky right it looks, good. It looks wonderful <laughs> I mean I got a bad Something going on here, you know, and I'll always I'll walk up to my younger, uh, younger, young, one, young, some of my younger guys that say, man, my, my hair, I got you, brother, you know, because, you know, we, we're into being who we are. That's, I mean, I can't help it because my hair is kinky. You can't help it because your hair is straight 
and you can't help it because you have curly, wavy hair. Both of us, names are Williams. His hair is a little bit more straighter than ours. We got some white blood in our family somewhere. Am I right about it? He's from Louisiana. My, my people are from Louisiana, and there was some hanky-panky going on, right? And so we got a lot of stuff that's, mixed, that's getting into this. You know, so if it's whiteness, it is whiteness. Some of it is whiteness. Some of it is blackness. Some of it is Latino. Some of it is, you know, and so it's, it's I don't think we should be ashamed of what it is. That's like Devin said, that's just what it is. You know, and we borrow from each other's culture, right? And, and so that's, that's just what it is. It's not, it's not a sin to, 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 to straighten your hair and wear your hair straight because you think that that's going to get you a better job. Right? I feel personally triggered by the dancing comments, so I think our next Theology on Tap <laughs> event should be dancing, and I'm going to show you that some of us white girls can dance just as well. Okay. Um, did you want to say something? Sorry, did I cut you off? Well, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Well, I think it's, I think part of it you have to consider in whiteness is that about a, a place where uh, a, a, someone's determining the culture a little bit more and that people are, it's, it's a box that people are trying to fit in. Watch middle schoolers. They all want to go to the popular because they're determining the culture and who's in and who's out. And I think that's a little bit when you think about whiteness, it's, that it's the dominant culture and people have to um, adapt to that dominant culture. And I hear that a lot of times. And I think if you're the dominant culture, you're not adapting, so you don't see it. But it's when you have to look a certain way, talk a certain way, act a certain way to fit in, then that is part of what it is. Okay, I'm jumping to another question. We have so many. Um, somebody here, I think Rachel maybe, or somebody mentioned church. This one is about churches. Can we talk about the lack of diversity in churches? Many black churches preach liberation theology. One of y'all is going to have to define that for the people here. Uh, is or should the gospel be different in different congregations? How do you reconcile the gospel with racial differences? I'm going to read it one more time. Can we talk about the lack of diversity in churches? Many black churches preach liberation theology. Is or should the gospel be different in different congregations? How do you reconcile the gospel with racial differences? I'm going to be a little maybe controversial and say, no, I don't think we should be worried about diversity in churches. Um, for the same reason that I'm not upset about different denominations. Uh, I don't lose sleep about the fact that there are Baptists and Methodists and Lutherans and Presbyterians and et cetera, et cetera. We're all Christians. We don't all have to be under the same building to be followers of Jesus Christ together. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's a, if, if black people want to be in a majority black church, why should I have something against that? I don't. Um, and if white people want to, again, it kind of gets back to this larger conversation of, of cultures that have been, you know, formed for decades or centuries in the making. And if those cultures lead to certain sort of church cultures, that's okay. I don't think that we need to have some quota system where half of everyone in the church is black and half of everyone is white. You know, to, as if we have something to prove. We don't have to prove anything. Troy's my brother in Christ, and we don't have to go to church in the same place on Sunday to prove anything to anybody. So, you know, I know that's not the popular thing. Everyone wants to be like, oh, church is such a segregated time on Sunday morning, and isn't it a shame? Well, what does that mean, it's segregated? Because we're not in the same building at the same time? Like, it's okay if they're worshiping down the street, and we're worshiping down the street. Um, but... Generally speaking, the gospel is what it is. So no, I don't think the gospel should be tailored. Liberation theology, uh, uh, big question, but basically it was a really origin in South America that was really about, you know, I mean, it was sort of communism and Christian garb, I, I, I think. I mean, other people might put it less, more charitably than that, but basically it was arguing for systemic change and equality economically and so on and so forth because Jesus essentially was a proto-socialist. And then liberation theology had ra later would have racial components to it, gender components to it, LGBT components to it, et cetera. But it began really more with income, equality, and so on and so forth. Um, but white people preach liberation theology all the time. I mean, all the time. Like, every progressive church is full of nothing but liberation theology. So... Yeah, my answer to the question would be an outright no. Is this on? 
Okay. Sorry, my answer to the question, should the gospel be different in different churches, is just an outright no. If anything, uh, I came to church very late in life, or to Christianity very late in life. I was 28 years old, and one of the things that I appreciated the most about the Christian message, indeed the Christian gospel, is that it flattens the playing field for everyone. It levels all distinctions, all divisions, and it does so in this way. It says, all have sinned, all fall short of the glory of God, uh, falls short of the glory of God, all are in Adam, meaning we're actually just one race. If you read the scripture for all it's worth, we're actually all one race, the race of Adam. And all our common condition is sin. And the only reparation for sin is actually made on the cross by Jesus Christ. His atoning death on the cross is what puts us all in the same category. Our sin categorically separates us from God. Christ's sacrifice on the cross makes a way so that all of us talk about inclusivity when people say that christianity is a white man's religion i think it's the most inclusive religion in the world because it actually says any of you could come into this fold and be my son or daughter i am willing to adopt you if you would just come to me it doesn't matter where you came from it doesn't matter what you did but you can come and join this family and i think the gospel needs to be that and it needs to be that everywhere i think that's awesome so one, um, I used to have a church on Evans, uh, within Evans Lutheran Church. And, uh, and so that's where I held the church, right? So he's Lutheran and I'm Baptist something. Will you just keep talking? Ba Our very expert guy will do his Okay, thing. Baptist so something, right? That means that, that I just believe in some of the things they believe in, but not in everything. And I do some other things differently. But one of the things that prompted me to start the church not necessarily there where he was, uh, and I was living in that community, so I was close by the community. I had a, a home uh, where I was helping ex-offenders, which was of all nationalities and all colors, and um, and I wanted, and the Lord just just um, spoke to me and told me to do that, right? And so, and so I walked around and for several years in that community, praying, getting out of the car, and doing all sorts of things that would like spirit led, I believe. And so here I am in the middle of, uh, uh, I'm there now, but if I back up 10 years before this happened, uh, I worked uh, several years before this happened, I worked uh, at a place called the Star of Hope. I was a chaplain there for uh, 14 years, uh, but also was part of a, um, a church that was all an African American except for one or two uh, white females who were married to black guys, right? And maybe another, uh, Hispanic female who was married to a, one of the black guys. And so I remember standing in, in the hall. Uh, I was at the Star of Hope. I remember standing in, the, in the, just an open area. And I think I had preached that night. And, and after I preached, and one of the guys came up to me. And I don't know if you guys know what the Star of Hope is, but it's a shelter where people go for recovery, drug and alcohol recovery, and for homelessness. But I preached that night, and the guy walks up to me and said, man. You know, I must have really got after it. You know, he just said, man, I, man, where's your church? I want to go to your church. And I looked at him. I said, I, and I tried to ignore him. I said, well, you can't come to my church. Why can't I come to your, well, you? Well, just, you just can't come to my church, right? And so because, and, and now you guys are going to look at me strange. And because my pastor would say things that were derogatory towards other races, right? And I said, and so I asked myself, I said, what kind of church, and all this happened in this very moment, I said, what kind of church am I in that doesn't welcome everybody? That's what I asked myself. I had been, I, I, I was going to this church, I'd raised my kids, my kids were 13, 14 or whatever. Uh, I'd been at this church for at least eight, 17 years or so. I said, what kind of church is this? The guy was Hispanic, and I'm sorry, the guy was Hispanic. And I said, and, and tears came to my eyes, and I said, what kind of church am I involved in where I can't take anyone? And so you know what I did after that? I didn't, I, I probably went back to that church like once or twice just to visit, see some friends, but that was it. We have 10 minutes left and I'm gonna cut us off at five. So I have several questions that have come in around the same thing. So I'm gonna read them 
and let you guys finish out on, on these themes. One person started with this guy. I don't know which guy. Maybe you, maybe one of you, but this guy, but not Rachel. You're off the hook. This guy seems to be denying the idea that institutional racism exists. If that is the case, what explains the large differences in so many outcomes like housing, wealth accruement, wealth accruement and jail rates? Another person writes it this way. If all of us are, from this, are the same, yes, are the same because we all came from Adam and Eve and therefore race isn't a problem, why are minorities so overrepresented in the prison population? And the third one, I'm trying to get as many questions in as I can. These are all sort of related. What systemic hurdles still exist in today's legal system prohibiting a level playing field moving beyond the 400 plus years of slavery? Again, this is not speaking, this is speaking about today, not Jim Crow, redlining, et cetera. You get the idea, right? I don't have to answer those again, huh? You know who it is? Oh, the him? Is it Juan Carlos? Yeah, okay, well, you know, he can handle it. See, that's what's wrong with racism. When we see things, we pretend as if we don't see it. But everyone in the room knows who the question is directed to, right? Don't, I mean, you gotta know who it's directed to, right? I mean, don't you? Well, I don't know when it came in, so it could but, have been But evident. we know. Right, so it wasn't me. It wasn't, That's right. it wasn't me, and it wasn't. But know. let's talk to this institutional racism. We only have a few minutes. <laughs> yeah, it, it could be the case that institutional racism does exist, but the the question is, does that make me a white supremacist? No, it doesn't. So I think I, you know, it, I'm, I'm not I'm not saying America is some perfect place where everybody has it like the justice system works the same for everybody because it doesn't. Uh, I'm not saying that we live in a fair society because it, we don't. Okay, what I am saying is that as Christians, okay, when you when we throw around something like racism and, and a phrase like white supremacist, which is extremely loaded language that does have a lot of historical baggage to it, the question is if we do have a racial divide, if we let's say we do have a justice system that's broken. Uh, where, where blacks are treated. How, how, do, how are we going to make this a better country? How are we going to make this a better place? What is the path forward? Is the path forward trying to convince me that I'm basically a Klansman? I don't think that's a good strategy, uh, you know, to basically try to convince 60% of America that, that their racism is so deep and so inherent that they don't even know they have it, that it's so systemic, and, and that if they deny it, actually that just proves the point. I, I don't think that's a good path forward at all. Uh, I think we, I do think that there's a lot of work that we can be doing to raise up, you know, let's say my son, maybe one day he'll go into the justice system and he will be in a position to help people because that's, that's how you change things, I, I think. You know, we can talk about systemic and this and that. What does that even mean? I mean, who, who, who's going who's gonna to solve the, who's going to snap their finger and make all the systemic problems go away? It doesn't work that way. Be a lawyer. Go advocate for people. Be a judge. Okay? And administer fair sentences. Uh, you know, why, why should everyone else, why should the system just have to fix itself? You go fix it. I'll go fix it. Okay. I'm going to ask anyone else that wants to answer this to just keep it to like a minute or under because I want to, yeah, I know. It's a big question. You say it again. Oh, boy. Uh, there were a few, but I'll just ask the first one. Uh, this guy. Um, oh. Sorry, my, uh, my system. Okay, this guy seems to be denying the idea that institutional racism exists. If that is the case, what explains the large differences in so many outcomes like housing, wealth, accruement, and jail rates? Basically, the question is about systemic racism. I, I think it's uh, if you always benefit from the system, it's really hard to see where other people don't. Well, that was succinct. Good job. She's from my church. <laughs> Anybody else want to? Chime in. Yep. Um, Troy seems to think that the question was aimed at me, and if it was, fine. Um, that's oh, fine. Yeah. Oh, I didn't realize that. Okay. Uh, come talk to me, whoever it was. Come talk to me afterwards. But what I find with these conversations is that often we're pointing to data that is disaggregated. Sorry, that has not yet been disaggregated. We're looking at an outcome that seems to paint a disparity without disaggregating the data that might point to all the various causes that might end up as the effect of a disparity. And I find that at the very least alarming, but <clears throat> when we look deeply into what gets us the effects, what causes get us the effects, 
those causes are found in all communities, not just communities of color. And what I mean by that is, for example, rates of education, fatherlessness, uh, whether or not fathers are in the home. There are so many different factors that go into what ends up being the end result of a disparity that are hardly ever talked about in the disaggregation of it. And basically what I mean is that you're pulling out these factors and looking at them individually. What we tend to want to do is to just find an easy um, name for a, an obvious problem. And I find that maybe that's where we're missing a lot of the discussion is talking about the various causes that lead to the effect and not just jumping to the conclusion that where there is a disparity, there must have been discrimination. I just don't find that to be the case. If you want to say something, I want to let you, but we are out of time. Do you want to throw something in real quick? Just because you, you just want to let us all know it was Oscar who was, who was the one. Come see me. Okay, well, so I'm gonna ask if, if you guys are willing to stay, stick around for a few minutes afterwards if people wanna talk to you or these guys. I'm gonna do two quick housekeeping things. I'm gonna invite, come on up, Patrick. Patrick, to, to send us out with kind of a benediction because these are hard concepts and things to, to wrestle with. But just a reminder, if you wanna keep talking about this tonight, uh, that guy in the back who's standing up, go talk to him and we will number people off and we'll go find a place to grab another drink and talk after hours. Okay, and then our next event is December 14th, so mark your calendars, and one of the things on that poll is what we're gonna be talking about, so definitely come back for that. Did I miss any housekeeping items? Because I wanna end on the benediction. Okay, come on up. Oh, and go see that handsome guy in the back to talk about, he's looking behind him. It's you, Taylor. Street Grace Ministries, check them out as well. Okay. We're gonna start off with just a couple of seconds of prayer, so I'd invite you to just bow your heads. Heavenly Father, we are all so afraid. Afraid of each other. Afraid of losing our place in line. Afraid of being skipped. Afraid of being forgotten. Afraid of being ridiculed. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would so flood us with the grace of your Son, Jesus Christ, that we can find it in our hearts to share that grace with one another, even when we look different from each other, even when we have opinions that enrage one another. We ask that your grace win the day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.